Good morning. Um, we are, um, we welcome you to the uh, Joint Subcommittee on Public Safety, Natural Resources and Transportation um, and we call this meeting to order and we I would ask the committee secretary to please call the roll. Assemblywoman Miller. Here. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblywoman Titus. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Senator Brooks. Here. Senator Goy Kachia. Here. Chair Dennis. Here. Thank you very much. And uh, um, just a couple reminders. Uh, keep yourself muted when you're not talking. Um, um, also, if you have any questions, I think I should be able to see everybody in the one view, but uh, so just kind of raise your hand and, and uh, or unmute and just say you want to ask if, if we, when we're asking questions. Um, also, for those of you uh, that are going to be uh, later giving public uh, comment, um, you can read or summarize um, uh, your comments if you wish to um, add, um, do written testimony, you may also do that. Um, so anyways, with that, um, we've got um, two things that we're doing today. Uh, we're going to finish the wildlife um, uh, budget that we we started that one day that we had a lot of budgets that we were doing and we just couldn't finish it. So we're going to finish it today. Um, and then I'm going to take a short break while uh, staff is able to hand out the um, uh, closing documents for the um, uh, a couple of the Colorado River Commission and some other um, budgets that we're doing. So that, those will get handed out. Um, so I'll take a break and make sure that everybody can get a copy of those. So as we go, but we're going to start first with wildlife. Um, we're going to start um, with, um, well, actually all the budgets for wildlife. So I know um, we've got the director here. So if you want to start and then just introduce anybody that you need to as you, you go along and we'll have some questions um, as we go through. Um, probably um, let you finish each budget account and then we'll ask questions. Um, so when you're ready, please go, please proceed. Excellent. Thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, committee members, for the record, Tony Wasley, Director, Department of Wildlife. And uh, what I'll do today is I'll, I'll give a high level uh, agency overview and then we'll, we'll dive into those budget accounts. Um, and Mr. Chair, with your recommendation, I'll pause after each of those budget accounts for, for questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Are you able to see that okay? Uh, Mr. Wasley, yes, we can. Please proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to quick overview of the agency's mission uh, to protect, conserve, manage, and restore wildlife and its habitat for the aesthetic, scientific, educational, recreational, and economic bit of benefits to citizens of Nevada and the U.S. and to promote the safety of persons using vessels on the waters of Nevada. The uh, Statutes are contained in NRS 501 through uh, 506, and then the uh, voting are in 488. Nevada's wildlife resources, in a nutshell, 895 different species regularly occurring in Nevada, the majority of which are birds, 456 species of birds, 173 species of fish, 163 species of mammals, 79 species of reptiles, 24 amphibians. And we have a, a couple newcomers of late. Uh, last session uh, was quite a to-do about uh, moose. We've got some moose that have pioneered into northeastern Nevada from Idaho and Utah. We've had a, a wolf or two uh, find its way down from Oregon. 
over the past couple years. Um, so that number is relatively stable, but we do have a few newcomers. As far as the uh, U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act and listing activities, there's currently 21 species under listing review, eight of which, uh, or excuse me, eight that are threatened, 19 endangered, and presently uh, zero candidates. The agency and commission organizational chart, uh, the governor appoints nine members of the Board of Wildlife Commissioners, uh, the director's office reporting directly to uh, the governor's office, and then within uh, the director's office, seven unique divisions. So as we look at those seven divisions uh, from left to right, data and technology services, conservation education division, law enforcement division, game division, fisheries division, and wildlife diversity and habitat. The last two of those wildlife diversity and habitat, those budgets uh, were previously closed, so we won't be uh, having any material necessarily from, from those two divisions. When we look at the agency as a whole um, with employees, approximately 360 employees, if, if we include um, the positions that are contained on the commission, although they certainly don't report to the agency, the agency uh, provides support staff uh, to those nine commissioners. We have approximately 50 seasonal staff and 30 contractors, um, many of whom uh, man the aquatic invasive species uh, stations around the state. Uh, roughly 120 buildings, 34 radio sites. Those radio sites are typically on mountaintops, radio repeaters on mountaintops that provide some necessary communications to the, the hinterlands, the, the back roads, if you will. 11 wildlife management areas uh, comprising approximately 120,000 acres, soon to be 12 with the uh, transfer of Carson Lake and Pasture, <clears throat> which is scheduled to happen very soon. Eight major facilities, seven unique divisions, four fish hatcheries, and then we divide the state into roughly equal sized administrative regions, three, three different regions. The Wildlife Commission, per NRS 501-171, the Wildlife Commission is comprised of nine gubernatorial appointees with three-year term. Uh, generally adhere to a two-term limit. Presently of the nine members, there's only one of those commission members who is serving in excess of two terms. Of the nine members, one must represent conservation, one must represent farming, one representing ranching, one from the general public, and five members who during at least three of the four years immediately preceding their appointment held a resident license to fish or hunt or both in Nevada. The commission's duties as described in 501181 to establish broad policies for wildlife management and boating safety, to provide broad policy guidance to the agency, adopt regulations for wildlife management and boating safety, and then adopt regulations specific to hunting, trapping, and fishing, for example, seasons and uh, bag limits, possession limits. All that's done through a transparent public process. The Wildlife Commission gathers input from the Department of Wildlife in the form of professional recommendations, uh, also gets input from the county wildlife advisory boards that uh, members are appointed by county commissions and then the general public. The Wildlife Commission gathers all that input, uh, deliberates, and on the back end of that is determination of policies, regulations, seasons, quotas, et cetera, that then guide the Department of Wildlife um, as we implement and enforce those, those policies and regulations. The Wildlife Commission is statutorily limited to uh, nine meetings per year, typically meets seven times a year. Those are typically two-day meetings on a Friday and Saturday. Uh, and then in legislative years, uh, typically an eighth meeting is held with uh, legislative matters. The agency works extensively with partners who work with multiple conservation organizations, the mining industry, the military, uh, federal partners, Fish and Wildlife Service, BLM, Forest Service, tribal partners, private landowners, of course, other state agencies, primarily the Department of Conservation, Natural Resources, and Department of Agriculture, and then numerous, numerous volunteers. When we look at the contributions of, of our volunteer base, um, we have uh, 
nearly 500 volunteers that contribute uh, nearly 10,000 hours and 68,000 miles. So the in-kind contribution towards federal uh, grants is uh, approaching $400,000 annually. We look at the agency's budget as a as a whole. Uh, the overwhelming majority is is user derived, and that and that orange uh, piece of that pie and the user derived that includes uh, federal uh, Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson federal excise tax as well as well as tag and license sales. Two percent of the agency's budget uh, is derived from the general fund, and then. 3% uh, cobbled together from a myriad of, of sources. I'm going to go through um, each of these budget accounts, uh, starting with the director's office, which is kind of the headquarters for the agency administration. Some of you may uh, be wondering why there's a photograph of uh, Clark County Commission Chambers. Uh, the State Wildlife Commission does use that facility when we meet in the, in the southern part of the state there in the upper left-hand corner. The director's office has 28 positions. Uh, that doesn't include the, the, wildlife, the nine wildlife commissioners or the members of the wildlife advisory boards from the counties. Uh, but it contains the fiscal services where all the centralized costs for the agency are housed. Uh, human resources, as well as engineering and, and facilities. We break that down a little bit further in the director's office. Uh, you'll see that um, roughly half is uh, cost allocation and shy, just shy of half is, is fees. We take that, that orange um, section of that pie and break it down. Uh, more finally to the right, uh, you'll see that the overwhelming majority of the fee contribution to the director's office is from uh, sportsman's fees. And again, that sportsman uh, revenue is uh, primarily, uh, almost exclusively, uh, license sales and, and tag sales. From the director's office uh, budget, a couple enhancements I, I want to uh, point out. Um, E234 efficiency and innovation. This is uh, just the maintenance costs associated with the uh, automated external defibrillators and travel costs for that safety coordinator. And E710 is replacement equipment, uh, automated external defibrillators. The E730 is uh, the, the largest of these. It's uh, state-owned facilities deferred maintenance. Uh, these requested budget enhancements will be used to address maintenance items at, at facilities that have been set aside in favor of other projects or programs over numerous budget cycles, contributing to an accelerated state of degradation and potential decrease in intended lifespan of the facilities. These maintenance items have been deferred as the costs associated with facilities maintenance have continued to rise. The department's facility maintenance budget has remained relatively unchanged. The department's maintenance budget remains insufficient with respect to the number of facilities and the extent of maintenance required at those facilities. Further deferral could potentially render some facilities inoperable and or unsalvageable. Uh, the department continually reviews the condition of its facilities and along with state public works division facility condition analysis reports to develop a prioritized list of deferred maintenance items and associated costs. The department's current priority classifications one and two encompass deferred maintenance in items including uh, building envelope, carpet, uh, facilities deep cleaning, HVAC, water treatment and roofing, all of which fall within the deferred maintenance decision units guidelines. Uh, these priority one and two classification projects consist of the remaining priority two and three classification projects from the last biennia that have been uh, upgraded due to their age and natural course of progression. Uh, the department's remaining uh, priority classification three projects uh, may have to be considered in alternate budget enhancements as they don't fall within the deferred maintenance guidelines. Um, and as, as indicated, the overwhelming majority of the deferred maintenance, um, paint, carpet, roof, uh, you know, general general maintenance categories. Uh, E731 fish hatchery uh, facilities deferred maintenance. 
um, at our four hatchery facilities. Um, we have 16 employee residences and 53 hatchery support structures and facilities. Uh, E732 wildlife management facilities, deferred maintenance, uh, 10 different employee residences, 95 wildlife management area support structures and facilities. And then uh, E903 is just a transfer from the director's office to the data and technology services division. And so that's that's uh, in parentheses there. So it just moves that authority uh, for a contract to the correct division. And you'll see that on the next budget uh, category as a plus rather than a minus. Uh, E806, it's a classified position change, uh, cost of zero. It's just reclassifying an administrative assistant two to a maintenance repair worker. The position would be responsible for performing semi-skilled repair, construction, and or building maintenance tasks on uh, southern region buildings and facilities, as well as other regions of the state. Assigned tasks may include, but aren't limited to basic plumbing, carpentry, framing, roof repair, uh, painting, basic electrical work, and exterior groundkeeping. Um, E901 transfer one administrative assistant to from also from the DATS budget account 4461, and you'll see a commensurate uh, recommendation on that budget category next. This position would be the position to be uh, reclassified to the maintenance repair worker. So that concludes the presentation for 4460. I'll pause there, Mr. Chair, to see if the uh, committee might have any questions. Um, yeah, we have some questions here. Uh, Senator Brooks, I believe you have the first question. Thank you, Chair Dennis, and uh, good morning, Director Rosley. Uh, my, my question's around your deferred maintenance issues, um, uh, 730, 731, and 732. Would the recommended funding for this biennium um, address the immediate maintenance needs? Yes, sir. Um, certainly, we we recognize the condition um, of the state's budgetary challenges. Um, this is really, um, you know, those urgent matters. Um, you know, we'll continue to try to upkeep those facilities and the things that can mean a lot in terms of extending uh, the life is simply uh, that exterior, that building envelope, having paint, having roofing uh, that can prevent you know long-term damage that could render those things unsalvageable but the request is as is here uh, before you today uh, we believe meets meets those needs and, and th thank you and do you believe that uh, those all the projects that are identified in those enhancements you'll be able to get done in this biennium yes sir absolutely thank you for the question thank you thank you thank you mr chair thank you um, and then I believe, let's see, we have a question uh, from uh, Assemblywoman uh, Monroe Moreno on the um, transfer of administrative assistant to Billy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, my questions will be um, along E901 and E806. Um, I know you mentioned it during the presentation, but could you tell us just how um, the transfer and, and the recommended reclassification of the administrative assistant position would impact the agency's data and technology services workload. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Uh, we have uh, performed some significant changes to our data and technology services division. Uh, it was last session that this body approved uh, renaming that division from what was the operations division uh, into data and technology services. And so we, we had some minor reorganization that allowed us to streamline significantly you know, many of the uh, computer processes that exist uh, within that uh, division. With that realignment, uh, we have relieved uh, you know, some personnel. At, at one point in time, we had significant uh, you know, manual data entry people keying things in and going to an online application system, for example, some of those administrative duties and, and details uh, are no longer needed. However, uh, we certainly continue to recognize the need for uh, maintenance and, and upkeep. And so uh, we, we don't feel that we are losing um, 
the ability to accomplish tasks in the data and technology services division, but we feel we'll be better able to protect the state's resources by having additional capacity in, uh, in the maintenance arena. Thank you for that. So with the realignment, will there be a reduction in the department's cost for the contracted maintenance or repair if the reclassification is approved? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, as as I was just stating, I, you know, I, I think that the level of needs in, in a number of state facilities and, and ours in, in particular um, suggest that we'll be able to accomplish more. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to accomplish everything and, and actually reduce that uh, cost. It would, however, reduce our reliance perhaps um, on contracted services um, and having that in-house uh, capacity to meet some of those more basic day-to-day -day needs and, and provide that upkeep necessary to, to protect uh, those facilities. Thank you so much for the answer and thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to have the questions. Thank you. Um, other questions that we have? on this budget. I'm not seeing anybody. Okay. All right, I think we are uh, ready to move on to the uh, next um, budget, the, the uh, 4461. <clears throat> you able to, to see the screen share again, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, I can see it. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, 4461 is the Data and Technology Services Division, again, formerly the Operations Division. Uh, 32 or so positions housed within this division. Uh, one of the primary responsibilities is, is the licensing. Uh, again, all the uh, hunting, fishing, uh, trapping licenses that the agency sells. Um, administered through this division, as well as the, the, the hunting applications and draws. Uh, we have applications uh, for and draws for turkey hunts, non-resident uh, guided hunts, the big game uh, hunts. All that is administered through this data and technology services division, as is our customer support function, geographic information systems, uh, boating, registration, and, and titling, uh, essentially uh, Department of Motor Vehicle type services uh, for watercraft, and then information uh, technology, our agency's IT, and you'll see some uh, requests specific to uh, IT in this, in this budget account. So as we look at uh, the budget for data and technology services division, you can see the overwhelming uh, majority, the, the largest orange chunk of the pie on the left is, is fees. Uh, just over 6 million is generated from uh, fees alone. And as we look more specifically at the fees on the right side of the screen, uh, just under 2 million, 32% uh, that's coming from application fees where anyone applying uh, for those previously mentioned hunts uh, pays a fee for the application. And then um, the blue portion of that pie on the right are uh, sportsmen, represent sportsman revenues, uh, roughly 65%. And those sportsman revenues are the tag sales, license sales. You can also see uh, just about 3%, the yellow slice of that pie on the right comes from the Aquatic Invasive Species Program, AIS, which is the stamp that uh, boaters are required to have on their vessel through a program that was approved through this body uh, several sessions ago. Uh, last session, the agency undertook a simplification effort. Uh, this, uh, this body uh, approved that um, department request last, last session. In the first three years with a new vendor that uh, was selected to implement that, the department has seen un unprecedented growth and looking at the graph, the, the orange line uh, represents fishing licenses through through time. Uh, the, the trough uh, in that occurring at about uh, 2017, that, that 
you can, it's evident on both the orange and the blue line. The blue line is hunting licenses. Uh, three years ago is, is where we uh, switched to the simplified license structure and uh, a new vendor. So we've, we've seen an increase of over 33% in the big game tag applications that are submitted. We've seen an increase of 77% in fishing licenses and an increase of 54% in, in hunting licenses. The budget enhancements uh, in this budget account include uh, E225, which is a position change to create a new IT professional position. This would eliminate, uh, again, administrative aid position and one seasonal administrative assistant position to create a new information technology professional position. The department currently has a very small IT services unit with only three designated position to support uh, over 250 full-time staff plus contracted and seasonal staff. The position would be assigned uh, application development to assist biologists to store and automate analyzing uh, data collected to conserve the Nevada's 895 species of animals. E230, uh, new equipment for new wildlife area tech two positions at, at Lake Mead. Um, this is uh, two new computers. I know uh, be a companion to E230 and the budget account 4465. E231, new equipment for new wildlife area tech two position, Alamo station. Essentially, uh, what you'll see in, in the budget account 4465, which is the fisheries division, is a uh, desire to create um, some wildlife area tech positions. These positions uh, staff the Aquatic Invasive Species Program um, stations around the state. It's currently uh, contracted positions, which create some challenges in um, having consistency with those positions and their performance. So that companion to E231 and, and budget account 4465 um, is where these computer purchases uh, would, would go. E E710 replacement equipment, uh, funds for servers and storage area network equipment. E712 replacement equipment, uh, funds for staff computers. E720 uh, new equipment, Wi-Fi for remote offices, trying to improve our Wi-Fi capability in the agency's remote offices in Elko, Ely, Winnemucca, and Tonopah. And uh, that goes part and parcel to the improvement in data uh, automation of data collection, as well as uh, sharing data. E901 uh, would transfer one administrative assistant to, to budget account 4460. This is a, a companion uh, item to what we just saw in 4460. And the position would be reclassified to the maintenance repair worker too. And then the E903 uh, transfer from the director's office to uh, data and technology services. That would move the authority for that Amplex contract to the correct division. And that uh, concludes the presentation for the budget account 4461. So I'll stop again and, and see if there are any questions there. Okay, yeah, I actually I have several questions. Um, Okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, first, uh, can you uh, talk about your IT projects um, that, that would be initiated uh, with this new IT professional, um, including any benefits um, that you're going to get from that particular project? Or yeah, project? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Chair Dennis. So one of the um, primary functions of the department um, in, in wildlife management is, is survey and inventory. Uh, another piece of that is providing um, comment to any proposed projects that are occurring on, on the landscape. And with Nevada being 85% federally administered, there's a, a fairly heavy NEPA for National Environmental Policy Act that uh, provides the state um, special standing of the state wildlife agency and providing comments relative to the potential impacts of proposed activities that are proposed to occur on federal lands or with federal dollars. And so um, the efficiency with which we can collect data, analyze data and share data is essential to the agency fulfilling our mission. So we, I spoke to that a little bit with, with some of those uh, recommended in, enhancements. 
presently what we are uh, moving towards is a <clears throat> tablet uh, type data collection system. Uh, we have required check-ins for certain species that are harvested. We have data collection that occurs in the, in the field remotely. And by uh, being able to use tablets and streamline that data collection, uh, we can certainly increase the efficiency. Uh, we, we no longer have to have the, the handwritten data sheets manually enter that data. Uh, there was a significant lag between data collection, uh, entering that data into a computerized system, and then pulling that data together, analyzing that data, and then sharing the data with industry to be able to meet our requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act to provide comment to proposed development projects on the landscape. So the projects uh, that that individual would uh, be focusing on is the automation of data collection, uh, data analysis, and then data distribution to industry partners and to help the agency fulfill its role through the National Environmental Policy Act in providing comment to proposed activities on federal lands or with federal funds. Thank you. It's, it's, it's so, so interesting how important data is now. You know, we never thought that we would need to gather all this stuff as much as, as we do and, and the, the ability to use it. Um, can you clarify what positions um, or uh, position or positions um, are intended for elimination to offset portion of the cost for this new position, the new IT position? Um, I don't know if I can or not. Let me flip to that real quick. And I might, I might ask division administrator, uh, the DAS division administrator, uh, Kim Munoz to speak to that. Kim, are you on? I am. Thank you, Director Wosley. For the record, Kim Munoz, Division Administrator of Data and Technology Services. We are currently looking to eliminate an admin assistant aide and a seasonal admin assistant um, to make up the difference for this IT professional. Between the giving up both of the positions, it's actually still a cost savings to the agency um, to give up the two and have the IT professional one position. So that's what we were looking at. Those two positions were in our call center. And as Director Wosley had mentioned earlier, some of the changes that we've made with the automation um, has, we've diversified being able to use staff from uh, all over the state to help with our call center. So we use a cloud service technology that allows our staff from um, our remote offices to assist the call center when needed, when their volume is getting higher. So because of the way that we've diversified this, we've actually um, have not needed to fill these two positions. Why I'm asking to reallocate them to where we do have a greater need within the department um, and get a developer. Thank you, and, and I, I think Senator Gokachia, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my, my question uh, to either Kim or uh, Director Wosley. Uh, now, I, I know IT has to be really critical, but uh, like your your tag applications and or the draw, is, is that done in-house or is that done by your contractor? Uh, I would think that would be a tremendous load in itself. Kim, would you care to answer the Senator's question, please? Yeah, thank you for the question, Senator. So the actual draw itself is done by our contractor, Calcomai. The applications are all done online using their cloud service. We do provide um, the call center uh, calls and we have a ticketing system. So if somebody needs support, they have a little box in the right-hand corner of the application that they can ask a question of that goes into a Zendesk ticket. Our staff then from there will pick up and answer those questions. When we do not man the phones um, during normal business hours, Calcomai staff does pick up uh, the remainder of those calls, so after hours. But our staff, during the big game application period, we work 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week for seven weeks. So, so we're, we're pretty busy, but Calcomai will pick up the overflow um, when the hold times get to a certain point. Um, it'll overflow to them to pick up to minimize that for our clientele. 
I thank you and thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just know it has to be a tremendous load and I didn't know how you were covering it with those few positions. Thank you. Thank you. And you may, I think you you answered this, but can you just talk about that, eliminating that seasonal administrative position, what that the impacts was? I, I think you, you were talking about that right before we went to that other question. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, so we have, uh, there is really no impact. We have diversified how we're having um, people call in, or I'm sorry, how we're having staff pick up those calls. So we have uh, six locations with DATS where we have counter staff. And some of them are in our, our remote, remote areas like Winnemucca or Ely. And so when those staff uh, have downtime and they don't have a lot of walk-in customers, they are subsidizing their time by using, uh, picking up the call center load. So instead of needing actual dedicated call center staff now, uh, we are actually making staff that we've already got fill their day by assisting on that call center, which doesn't, which allows us not to need to fulfill these two positions. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have any other questions? I haven't seen any hands. I, I have a couple um, that just as you were doing your presentation. So I wrote down you have, um, is it um, 32.6 positions? Is that just in the data and technology services? Yes, Chair, that's correct. Um, that's for the for the data and technology services division statewide. So how do you how do you divide those up? I mean, how many offices do you you have some remote offices? I saw in some of the smaller and what about in the bigger cities? How do you how do you split those up? <clears throat> so. Um, we divide the state into three uh, you know, roughly equal size administrative regions, uh, western region, um, eastern region, the, the four counties in, in the northeast, the southern region, the four counties in the south. We have regional headquarters offices in, in each of those. We, <clears throat> we have the ability to track the volume of transactions, uh, volume of, of sales, uh, and we a lot of that is in the form of boat um, registration and and titling with some peak peak times of the year so we we have uh, been adaptable um with those positions and when we have vacancies we look at the level of, of volume and transactions and, and needs um, and a lot of, of that type of approach is what you're seeing with these suggested changes with transferring positions and reclasses is, is that kind of adaptability um, we have some remote offices we have an office in in ely uh, we have a, a field office in Eureka that doesn't provide uh, counter services. Um, and we have an office in, in Winnemucca as well. It, it becomes much more of a challenge to have uh, you know, full-time customer service staff in, in Winnemucca and Ely, for example. Um, it's tough to have coverage, um, but we, we advertise you know, flexible hours and encourage people to to call ahead, but we've also transitioned significantly to online services. So uh, we still have uh, a strong presence in our three regional offices, including uh, Vegas, Reno, and Elko, where the majority of the over-the-counter business occurs. But as we've transitioned to more and more online activity, implemented auto renewal functions, um, 365 licensing, we've, we've reduced a lot of those over-the-counter transactions significantly. So we continue to monitor um, and adapt accordingly. Thank you. Um, also, um, how do you, with your tech, with, with all these different offices, how do you handle your tech support for the, all of that? You're... <clears throat> yeah, I'll invite uh, Ms. Munoz to, to address that since that is uh, within her purview. Thank you for the question, Chair. Thank you for the question, Chair. So we do have three full-time uh, FTEs in our data, uh, our IT department. We do rely on EATS for the connectivity to SilverNet. Besides that, our three positions do cover the remainder of the state offices. So they do schedule and will drive out to those offices when they need support. If we cannot handle what is needed uh, remotely. So do you, but with your big R offices, do you, uh, do you keep, where are they housed out of? Are they all, do you have like one in each one of the big ones and then they go out to the other areas? Is that how they, you do that? No, so all of the IT staff are housed at our headquarters location. Um, here.
here at Sierra Center. And so when support is needed, they do travel to the office that they're looking for. Yeah, so it's they'll either travel down to Vegas or Elko. Um, they do, they are now with technology and being able to like take over computers using Teams and remote desktop sharing and stuff like that. We can handle a lot uh, from being remote here at headquarters, but if it requires physical, like we're replacing out computers or switches, um, things like that, then they will schedule that and travel out to those locations. So, so how many employees uh, do you have? I mean, how many like PCs do you have like in Vegas and Elko that needed to be supported? Um, so the PCs would be the number of staff in those locations. I don't have the actual numbers of staff at each location, um, but we can get that for you. Okay, just wondering, because I, yeah, that's one of the issues that we've always had in the past is sometimes we, we got all the workers down in one place and the IT staff's in the other one, you're always having to travel and there's a lot of travel expenses associated with with that. And uh, so I always I always ask about that just to, I mean, it's one thing if you have one or two people in one place, but if you've got, you know, quite a few employees and they have to constantly be traveling to fix computers, it doesn't seem very efficient, but, um, Okay, um, I think that's uh, the uh, um, on the this, the Wi-Fi equipment that you're doing. Is that just like routers and things like that that you're just updating, or are you actually putting in new technology? We're at, thank you for the question. We are in a lot of our locations adding Wi-Fi to the buildings. They don't currently have Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi in some of our bigger offices, but with this, what we're going to do is actually uh, Wi-Fi enable the rest of the offices that the department has. Great. Thank you very much. Any any other questions? Okay, um, let's move on to uh, the next budget, uh, 4462. Okay, 4462 is our Conservation Education Division. Uh, the Conservation Education Division contains 24 positions, uh, five main uh, areas of, of service. Um, hunter safety training. So uh, anyone born after 1960 in order to purchase uh, eligible for a, for a hunting license needs to have hunter safety. There's also hunter and angler education. Uh, for example, individuals might wanna learn how to fly fish or tie a fly. Uh, we also have general wildlife education, uh, know your Nevada wildlife, uh, trout in the classroom programs in, in our wildlife education program. Uh, media and public relations, <clears throat> excuse me, all of our uh, press releases, uh, this, this is our uh, PIOs, et cetera, and then the urban wildlife program, uh, which has been a topic of discussion uh, in, in this body in, in past sessions. We look at the, uh, the budget in 4462, um, the over half, the overwhelming uh, majority is uh, federal dollars, uh, less than a quarter comes from fees and looking at the more specific breakdown of those those fees on the right side there, uh, the majority of those fees are sportsman uh, revenues, again, tag and license sales, and a small portion, about 3%, uh, comes from applications. The enhancements, E711 replacement equipment. This is a request for uh, funds for vehicles that have reached their end of useful life. Uh, E227, a position changes to create uh, new conservation educator positions. This would eliminate two seasonal conservation aid volunteer positions and add two conservation educator positions. These positions will increase department capacity to provide volunteer coordination. And I mentioned uh, at the outset the, the value of in-kind contribution uh, from volunteers. That in-kind contribution is um, what is accepted by the federal government as match uh, for grants. However, they have uh, reporting requirements um, <clears throat> that, that make it so that we need to have some fairly effective and efficient and timely coordination of volunteers in order for that match, um, that in-kind contribution to be to be eligible. Um, <clears throat> it would also uh, provide educational programming to proactively address concerns in the community, such as some of the human wildlife conflicts. Similarly, uh, demands from within the education realm is far more than we can currently accommodate. And the uh, pandemic has really 
increase that. It's it's a good thing, um, but virtual distance learning and, and virtual programs. So these positions would add additional capacity in this area, as well as community education and, and public information and, and relations. The uh, that that 227 um, would be 60 percent. Uh, 60% of that cost would, would be from uh, wildlife restoration uh, federal funds and 40% would be um, sportsman revenue. And then uh, E800, the cost allocation, which is just the uh, funds for the department cost allocation to the director's office. I did uh, <clears throat> want to just kind of provide an update on the urban wildlife program uh, because it has been such a topic of discussion uh, before this body in the past. In, in 2020, the agency received uh, nearly 4,000 urban wildlife calls. Most were regarding baby birds or aggressive wildlife. Uh, we spent an estimated 7,128 hours and, and traveled almost 26,000 miles resolving those urban wildlife issues uh, during 2020. Uh, what we really try to do is give callers the tools to reduce conflict through, through education. So the goal of the program is to educate the community on living with wildlife through one-on-one -on -one interactions during urban wildlife calls, along with proactive outreach and education aimed at preventing conflicts with wildlife and equipping community members with the tools necessary to achieve solutions. Uh, we uh, provide a, a number of um, programs to uh, homeowners associations, et, et cetera, um, provide opportunities. We have, we have some <clears throat> presentations and, and uh, material that we can share. And we really try to empower uh, people to be able to resolve those, those issues with, with knowledge and, and education. Wanted to <clears throat> show one of the uh, products that has been developed as a result of some of the increased capacity that uh, this body has provided the department in past sessions. Um, <clears throat> with our ability to track uh, those calls, uh, we can actually create these, these heat maps. And this was a map created by the uh, GIS staff uh, from the DATS division based on data collected from, from callers. Uh, when those callers reporting wildlife um, indicate their, their location, uh, that's that's mapped. And so the image on the left uh, is Las Vegas, and you can see um, the hot spots, uh, Paradise, Henderson, and then uh, Boulder City especially. The map on the right is uh, the Reno Sparks area, and you can you can see those hot spots as well, where Northwest uh, Sparks, um, bright bright yellow, high number of calls there uh, around around the airport, and then over in Northwest Reno and then up in, up in Lemon Valley. So what that allows us to do is to do proactive outreach and contact uh, you know, community uh, members or HOAs in those areas and, and try to proactively uh, educate folks on you know, removing those attractants and subsidies and uh, what they should or shouldn't do and um, just try to, try to help empower them. Uh, <clears throat> Conservation Education Division, um, works to promote the agency programs, services, and recreational opportunities while educating citizens about state wildlife and boating rules and developing educational programs. Wildlife education and webinar programs reached thousands of citizens during 2020. The Data and Technology Services Division that we um, already presented is responsible for the customer service interface, license and tag sales, and, and vessel titling and registration. That call center, as Ms. Munoz referenced, is staffed 16 hours a day, seven days a week, with Endow staff being the primary contacts from eight to five on, on business days. So that concludes uh, this budget account, and I'll pause there again, Mr. Chair, for, for any questions. Sure, I, Assemblywoman um, Miller has some questions on this. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Mike, my first question is what would you, uh, attribute the increase in public demand for the uh, services to? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. Um, there are a, a number of uh, reasons, and I'll speak to um, perhaps the, the distance learning virtual. Um, there is an obvious um, effect of the pandemic where teachers were looking for 
uh, material uh, that they, in many instances, if it was prepared, you know, in advance, it could fill um, some of those needs um, in terms of curriculum. And uh, we have a uh, Know Your Nevada wildlife program, and we had a huge uptick in the number of teachers uh, signing up for that. <clears throat> we have a trout in the classroom program that has historically been limited by uh, equipment, tanks, and water chillers. And we were able to submerge a camera and provide that more, more virtually. So part of it has been pandemic related. Um, in terms of the urban interface and some of the uh, increased demands relative to the urban interface, um, you know, I, I think part of that's population based. Uh, part of it is where that development is occurring. Um, we're seeing, you know, more and more as, as cities grow out, um, there you're constantly, uh, you know, pushing that interface between humans and, and wildlife. And we've seen a huge uptick in the number of calls um, in the human wildlife, you know, interaction arena. So I think those are two things in particular as populations continue to grow. We get into drought situations, for example, and look, just looking at Las Vegas Valley, uh, you know, you have golf courses that are irrigated that certainly cause um, population growth in small mammals, rodents. Um, those are logical uh, food sources for, for desert coyotes that can just follow drainages in and and hunt in and around those areas. So as we alter the landscape and alter our position on it, we're altering that human wildlife interaction dynamic and some of that is resulting in increased um, demands on, on the department's services. Okay, um, I have a few follow-up questions, Chair. Um, so Thanks. do you, thank you. Do you feel the two full-time uh, conservation educator positions will actually help the agency um, be able to fulfill the, the increased demand, especially for the education services? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman. It will certainly help. Um, we, we have seen uh, significant growth in our conservation education division uh, in that particular area. I don't necessarily mean growth in terms of uh, number of positions, but growth in terms of program development and interest in those programs. Um, there are some promising um, federal bills that should be forthcoming that could also add some significant capacity in the terms of, of bodies and, and programs and in those areas as well. It's it's an area that, um, you know, I, I would love to see um, grow. I, I look at certain states, I always use Missouri as an example. Um, they teach uh, Missouri uh, conservation as part of their core curriculum, third grade through high school. They teach a six week course on conservation in, in Missouri. I would absolutely love to have the ability to teach, uh, you know, know your Nevada wildlife incorporated into our, our state curriculum and learn about Nevada's wildlife, learn about conservation for Nevada. Um, that, that's a goal, uh, but one step at a time and, and these, these positions, as I, I stated, would also have some responsibilities as it pertains to uh, capturing volunteer hours and volunteer efforts, which are, are mm -hmm. invaluable in terms of that in-kind contribution. It, it increases um, you know, the, our eligibility in, in uh, receiving those federal funds by having that. And so rather than having to use sportsman revenue or general fund, um, we can use that in-kind contribution. And so we're approaching 400000 dollars of in-kind contribution, that's going to make us eligible for 1.2 million it's, as a three to one match. So it's, it's uh, the return on investment is huge in, in terms of coordinating and capturing those volunteer efforts. Uh, but there's also a lot of exciting opportunities uh, in the conservation education arena. That's great to hear. Uh, just one final question about this shifting of positions. Uh, if you with if you do get the two new full time conservation educator positions, um, will there be other shifting of positions in the in the uh, agency specifically the two seasonal the two seasonal um, conservation aides? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, and I can certainly invite um, the conservation education division administrator. Uh, Chris Vasey to, to weigh in on that. But I, I think one of the things that uh, we 
pride ourselves on as an agency is that adaptability and constantly evaluating the agency's needs, the, the public's needs, and how can we best meet those, those public needs. We, we spend a lot of time and energy talking about customer service, recognizing who we, who we, who we serve and can we better serve them um, by adjusting our staffing and, and adapting to those express desires and demands. And so, um, you know, there, there may be a short-term plan associated with that that I'm, I'm not aware of, but in long-term, we're going to continue uh, to be flexible and adaptable um, in responding to the citizens' express uh, needs. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do we have any other questions on this budget account? Not, okay, I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, um, I guess we can move on to the next budget, the 4463. So 4463 uh, is our law enforcement division and I'll, I'll point out that uh, our law enforcement division, 53 positions is the agency's single largest uh, division. Um, despite that we uh, have law enforcement as our single largest division, we still, um, we still have some challenges in, in meeting the, the needs out on the landscape. Uh, we have a significant number of, of vacancies. Uh, we do have a lot of turnover. Uh, unfortunately in this division and at present time um, looking at the vacancies looking at the officers that are stationed on the water leaves only 11 uh, officers for land patrols for the entire state um, and so you may hear the agency speak to you know certain proposed bills with concerns over capacity and able to meet the the intent of various bills um, it, it's really due to just having so few people to cover so much area. Uh, <clears throat> six main um, areas of focus and function in the law enforcement division, obviously wildlife enforcement and wildlife enforcement protecting Nevada's wildlife, uh, poaching, uh, et cetera, unlawful take, unlawful possession, uh, boating enforcement, uh, and I previously made the reference to uh, you know DATS as uh, Department of Motor Vehicle function for, for watercraft. Uh, our law enforcement um, has the jurisdictional authority for uh, safe operation of, of vessels on the water, or essentially the, the highway patrol of the, the waterways. Uh, general public safety, um, that may include um, a loaded gun in a vehicle or wearing a, a life vest, uh, you know, in a, in a canoe or kayak or paddlecraft, um, having um, fire extinguisher in, in, a, in a vessel. Boating education, uh, boaters, uh, similar to hunters, uh, this, this body passed uh, legislation a few sessions ago requiring boating education for, for uh, operators under a, under a certain age to be able to operate vessels. And then dispatch services. I mentioned 34 uh, radio repeaters at the outset. Um, we have uh, a dispatch uh, center that dispatches officers all over this, the state. Again, it's uh, important officer safety. Oftentimes we have officers that are um, single unit uh, patrols well off road, oftentimes knowing that the individuals they're going to be encountering are, are armed. Uh, and then uh, radio technology. We, we also have to maintain those radio uh, repeaters and install radios in, in the vehicles. And it's been uh, brought up to oft, oftentimes about uh, uh, maybe integrating with some of the other uh, state law enforcement entities. And um, certainly would love to see, you know, a single um, communication system. However, what, what we continually find is that, you know, highway patrols needs, for example, uh, are primarily along the roadways. Our needs are different in that, you know, we need coverage and canyons and draws and uh, the backside of the mountains that aren't always covered by uh, some of the other law enforcement communication systems. The boating uh, law enforcement side uh, responsible for protecting wildlife resources, ensuring the safety of the public 
and the department um, is responsible for the safety of, of citizens on all of Nevada's waterways. I will uh, point out the, the photo in the upper left, uh, a warden uh, with a, a bunch of uh, shed antlers. Uh, this, uh, this body uh, directed the commission to draft regulation um, pertaining to shed antler collection. Uh, the commission uh, took that issue up and did pass a, uh, a season and, and restrictions in certain counties where uh, habitat uh, was being impacted and animals were being uh, disrupted. Looking at the law enforcement division, <clears throat> the overwhelming majority of funding for law enforcement comes from fees. So you see a huge uh, federal funding nexus in all of the other divisions. The federal excise tax collected through uh, Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson uh, are not, um, we can't utilize those for law enforcement activities. So um, nearly 80% of the expense associated with our law enforcement comes directly from sportsman fees. And again, that's uh, revenues from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and uh, tags. The enhancements for budget account 4463, um, E229 is a position change to create a new full-time game warden three position. This is actually a, a cost savings. This eliminates two seasonal game warden three positions and creates one full-time game warden three position. It would be assigned primarily uh, to recreation, boating, uh, safety patrol on Lake Tahoe. <clears throat> we had uh, two seasonal positions as this indicates. Um, with the idea that it, it, it didn't make sense to have a one year round position when really there was a, an on season and off season as it pertained to Lake Tahoe. But with the, the seasonality of those positions, it, it presented some, some challenges in, in recruiting and retaining uh, you know, good qualified individuals um, to act in, in those positions. We felt the agency uh, and public would be better served to have um, a single full-time game warden three position rather than trying to staff these two seasonally. Uh, the position would also assist other area game wardens by supplementing coverage of land duties in the area and decreasing the amount of time that they, that they may be called away from duties in land areas to cover uh, duties on, on the water. E301 body cameras for game wardens. Um, it's funds uh, for contractual obligations for body-worn camera systems used by game wardens. Body cameras are now considered best practice and the agency would like to initiate the process of obtaining body cameras to meet public expectation and new changes to law enforcement uh, practices. That uh, amount is, uh, is the uh, five-year contract for a web-based system used by LE staff to capture content and data from the body cameras. E710 replacement equipment, uh, replacement of safety equipment uh, for both uh, land and water, um, relatively um, larger amount. Um, this decision unit includes items such as a, a safe 19 center console patrol boat uh, base hole. This is the largest uh, single expense in this decision unit at just under 200,000, uh, also a new dispatch console, uh, travel trailer, uh, generator, um, some outboard motors with uh, rigging kits, taser, and a, a new radio repeater. Oops, sorry. Um, E711 replacement equipment, uh, replacement of vehicles that have reached their end of useful life, and E720 uh, would fund new dry suits for game warden uh, safety on water for protection and adverse weather conditions. It's also E800, which is the cost allocation to the director's office, and then E805, the position change uh, for a new administrative assistant three position. It would just reclassify an administrative assistant two to an administrative assistant three, commensurate with the duties of the position. Uh, the incumbent researches all information for program expenditures relating to boating equipment from internal and external sources. 
All of this information is communicated when the incumbent uh, provides these findings to supervisors and managers responsible for making these purchasing decisions. The trust and a level of autonomy are required to make the decisions and maintain the critical databases and financial business of the division is large and clearly falls within the AA3 class specs. And that concludes uh, the presentation on budget account 4463. Mr. Chair, I'll pause there for questions. Thank you. Uh, I believe uh, Assemblywoman Peters has a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you talk about um, the relationship with the, of the new one full-time position to the increased boating traffic and whether you think that's really enough to meet the patrol, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and enforcement duties required on Lake Tahoe? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Peters. Um, I think it's a, an excellent question. and. Um, <clears throat> we uh, thought we'd be able to better meet uh, the needs and the demands at, at Lake Tahoe, having two people on the water, you know, during the high season up there. Again, we struggled with um, consistency and, and recruiting people and having people in those positions where they often sat uh, vacant. So. Part of the decision was that having one full-time position uh, dedicated to that would would ensure that there was uh, a presence there. Um, and then we can augment that, uh, certainly Fourth of July festivities and you know as it falls on a weekend or Labor Day, those periods of high use, uh, we can augment uh, with other officers you know in this part of the state that have um, have boating responsibilities or certainly uh, boating abilities. But I would I would also invite uh, Chief Warden uh, Maynard to to address that um, it, if if you'd like a little bit more information there, if he might be able to add to that. Chief, are you available? I am. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Peters. Um, there were numerous factors that were involved in this decision. These positions have been currently in seasonal status for several years. A uh, couple of problems we found with the, the seasonals is they're required to have the same amount of training and uh, certifications and uh, qualifications through post that all the other officers have. And when you factor in that percentage of time, it cuts into the boating time. They're, they simply don't just show up and do boating with no other duties. There's a lot of other uh, aspects of a law enforcement officer's uh, professional development and career path that they have to uh, also accomplish in addition to that. Again, as the director pointed out, we've had significant problems uh, filling those positions and retaining them as they are part-time positions. We feel that we can adequately cover the needs and adjust to that as easier with a full-time staffing than we can with part-time staffing going forward. Thank you. That answered my <clears throat> next question, which was going to be what kind of obligation is there for a part-time versus a full-time? And if they're the same, then I, I can totally understand why it would be more reasonable to find someone who would stick around full-time. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Senator Gokatia, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, either uh, Mr. Walsley or Mr. Maynard. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming you, and you kind of answered the question there to Ms. Peters, but are all your officers, your 40 wardens, are they all category one police officers? Go ahead, Chief. Thank you, Senator Gokatia, for the question. Um, all our officers are category one peace officers and that is another factor involved in the difficulty in hiring for the position is that it's the top tier law enforcement category proposed and we have to maintain that so they even the seasonals would need to fit within that category yes i appreciate that and i can see how hard it would be to fill a Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, someone in Watts has a question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I have a, a quick question about uh, the item for body-worn cameras. I was just wondering if you could, um, one, clarify if there's uh, any mandate requiring that that uh, the department move in this direction of deploying those cameras and um, also um, just provide a little bit of additional background on your interest in moving in this direction. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Watts, and I'm gonna let Chief Maynard um, handle that. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Watts. Uh, there were multiple parts of the decision-making process to get us here. Number one, statutorily, at current, we are not required to carry them. Um, we were not included in the bill, I believe it was back in 2019, that it didn't encompass us. Um, and with, especially with the growing uh, need for transparency in all areas of law enforcement, we feel that it is prudent and best practices, even though we have no statutory requirement at this time to, to have them, that it serves the public's best interest and the law, the law enforcement officer's best interest to have that tool available so that we can ensure the highest level of transparency we can and the you know, best possible service and protection to the public and our office. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I haven't heard as as much uh, um, concerns about um, some of the, the actions that are being taken, but I can certainly imagine some scenarios where having um, the footage from those cameras may be helpful in certain um, encounters with uh, enforcing voting and, and hunting and other uh, laws. So appreciate the the response and the commitment to increasing transparency from, from your department. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm not seeing any, any other questions. Okay. Um, so we could move on to the next item, which is 4464. 4464 is the budget count for the game management division. The game division has 35 uh, FTEs. Again, uh, six key areas of, of focus for the game division, wildlife survey and inventory. Um, our quotas, our uh, possession limits, daily limits, uh, a lot of the regulations that are passed by the commission are informed uh, by wildlife survey and inventory data. Uh, we make recommendations on the seasons and harvest quotas to the commission based on the wildlife survey and inventory. We also have a landowner a conflict resolution program housed within the game division. We have um, damage uh, compensation tags, we have incentive tags, uh, we have direct payments for damage, uh, tag voucher system, all intended to reduce uh, landowner uh, conflict, provide some resolution. We have a wildlife health monitoring program. We have a, a wildlife veterinarian, uh, vet tech staff. We do research collaboration. Uh, we collaborate uh, with uh, other agencies on research, uh, USGS, uh, universities uh, all over the country. And then we also have our air operations housed within our, our game division. The air operations division uh, is comprised of, of two uh, Bell 407 HP uh, helicopters. Um, so we're able to uh, get to a, a number of the, the wildlife species in, in remote areas and uh, sample and survey them to inform our season and, and quota recommendations. And opposite from the uh, division um, budget that we just looked at, um, the game division 4464, you'll see that 60% of that is federally funded and, and that those federal funds again are, are coming from federal excise taxes that are collected from the uh, manufacturer sales on guns and, and ammunition through the Pittman-Robertson Act. Uh, we look at the fee portion, 38% of the game management division's budget comes from, from fees. 
and those fees, 75% uh, are sportsman fees, uh, license and tag sales, and almost 25% come from uh, the $3 predator fee where every sportsman or woman who applies for a big game tag um, must pay $3 uh, per application uh, to hunt. Um, and that, that generates uh, about nearly 25% of the fee portion of the game management division budget. As far as uh, budget enhancements, E-235 uh, create new pilot three position in the air operations program. Um, this would create that position. The department's pilot flight hours have produced an increase over the last several years. And I, I just mentioned that our air ops is, uh, consists of two uh, Bell 407 HP helicopters. Those helicopters have far more capability. They're relatively new to the department and they replaced a couple Bell 206 helicopters. The 407s um, have increased capabilities that the department is now taking advantage of, uh, slinging water to water developments, uh, slinging materials to construct water developments, um, seating capacity, other things have increased the uh, flight hours for uh, the two pilots that uh, are presently uh, there. So currently those pilots are flying between 475 and 525 hours annually. The industry standard is 350 hours uh, annually. An additional pilot would result in increased safety and reduced hours of uh, comp time paid to current pilots. And our pilots each fly wildlife biologists and, and others on various wildlife surveys throughout Nevada. Additional duties, as I indicate, uh, include slinging materials into remote locations uh, for construction of, of water developments. Uh, or slinging water into remote uh, water developments. And our pilots may also be tasked with assisting uh, Department or Division of Forestry with, with wildfire fighting operations. And those operations, it's, it's not as simple as saying, well, you have a helicopter and a, a bucket, we can put water in, um, you know, go fight fire. Um, you have to be uh, carted, you have federal, that ship has to be carted, certain federal requirements. Um, however, just being able to provide some support capacity, whether it's it's ferrying uh, pilots or borrowing pilots, um, there there are some opportunities uh, to for the state to to benefit elsewhere. E710 uh, replacement equipment. This is a replacement of one all-terrain vehicle that has reached the uh, end of uh, useful life. Uh, that E710 again, 75% of that amount would be uh, federal funds and then 25% would uh, come from uh, sportsman revenue. E711 replacement equipment, replacement of vehicles that have reached end of useful life, uh, essentially uh, uh, field vehicles, field uh, pickup trucks, and then E800, the cost allocation, funds for the department cost allocation to the to the director's office. Uh, the, the vehicles, uh, 75, 25 federal, uh, Sportsman. So I will pause there, Mr. Chair, uh, for any questions. Yes, we have some questions here. Um, Senator Brooks. I think you're still muted. Uh, uh, I believe my questions were answered um, in the presentation, but thank you for following me. Oh, you got it. Okay, great. Um, I, I have one quick question. Um, when you talked about the air support, is is there any um, um, any movement, e even nationwide, as far as wildlife um, divisions um, using drones to do some of the work that the air that you guys are doing through the air, through planes and or helicopters? Uh, that's an excellent question, Chair Dennis, and uh, there are a number of emerging technologies that can um, maybe decrease our reliance, if you will, on the helicopters, none of which fully replace them. Um, however, there's some exciting opportunities with drones, um, you know, using those to, to do nest checks, for example, or uh, 
there's some camera technology uh, that can, those drones can be equipped with to do habitat assessments, look at uh, vegetation. We also have, uh, we use a private contractor uh, through Hawaii Air to look at uh, sage grouse leks. They have a infrared camera, uh, a forward looking infrared camera. We're able to identify um, leks uh, from without disturbing them. So there's a number of emerging technologies. Drones are, are one and they can be combined with some of the other technologies, for example, um, infrared, uh, NDVI is a normalized difference vegetative index that can give us uh, habitat quality parameters and, and we can use drones to get some of that information. Um, presently, uh, there is no true replacement for helicopters, partly due to, um, as we talk about lifting uh, buckets with water, we don't have that capacity in a, in a drone, battery life, uh, distance of, of control. Um, we often use the helicopters to physically separate the animals. We get large winter concentrations of elk where you may have six or seven or 800 elk in a single group. And to use the presence of the helicopter, uh, you can uh, shave off a portion that can be more accurately classified and then go back into the group and cut out, much, much like you might use a, a cutting horse to separate livestock. Uh, we do it on a grander scale with the, with the helicopter and it, it cuts the, the herd size into more workable uh, chunks and I'm, I'm not sure that we'd be able to accomplish that as effectively with a drone but it's an excellent question and we're applying it um, in a number of, of places and, and look for more opportunities there. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Gokachia. Thank you Mr. Chair and, and Tony are you guys just flying the two helicopters you don't have any fixed wings? Uh, I thought uh, thank you for the question, Senator. The agency uh, did have a uh, Cessna uh, that was used uh, intermittently for some waterfowl surveys. Um, that Cessna uh, was sold a few years ago and the proceeds from that were used as the match um, along with federal dollars to procure uh, one of the helicopters that replaced uh, one of the 206s. So um, air operations used to consist of two Bell 206s and a, and a Cessna. Um, we sold the Cessna and used the proceeds from that to upgrade um, to newer, safer, and more capable uh, helicopters and now just have the two helicopters. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's go on to the next uh, budget, the 4465. 4465 is our fisheries management division, uh, 46 FTEs, uh, sport fish production. I mentioned that with four uh, hatcheries, uh, we produce uh, sport fish, uh, primarily uh, trout for put and take fisheries. We also uh, have fisheries management where we're managing um, populations, existing populations, uh, native aquatics, uh, that native aquatics includes both uh, game species uh, such as long cutthroat trout, as well as some non-game species, a whole host of desert fishes uh, in, in the south uh, that require um, attention. Aquatic health monitoring, uh, both uh, the health of the aquatic system uh, water quality parameters, temperatures, turbidity, um, alkalinity, et cetera, as well as the health of the aquatic organisms. And then the Aquatic Invasive Species Program is housed in the Fisheries Management Division. Many of the enhancements um, that you'll see in this budget account are specific to that Aquatic Invasive Species Program. It's a program that was established by uh, this body several sessions ago, and you saw some of the uh, the AIS uh, related uh, fees in, in uh, in the budgets. You'll see some more of that here. So as we look at the fisheries uh, management division, again, a, a huge 68% uh, of this budget is federal dollars. Those federal dollars uh, primarily through the um, Dingle Johnson Act that collects uh, federal excise tax on, on fishing equipment uh, and then is matched uh, three to one. Um, by uh, fees. And if we look at the breakout of fees, uh, we have roughly equal portions of trap stamp fees and sportsman fees. Uh, so that trap stamp, some of you may be wondering why uh, it says trap stamp when we did away with all the stamps. 
um, although we did away with the stamps, we did not do away with the restricted reserve account and the statutory requirements of its um, usage. What we did is we looked at the seven year average uh, of the percentage of those sales and we apply that to the sales of fishing licenses so we continue to have uh, revenue associated with that trout stamp program despite the fact that we don't have a physical trout stamp. Uh, and so of the sportsmen or of the fees at 30 percent that come from the state, roughly uh, 47 percent from trout stamp and 44 percent from sportsmen. And then there's the aquatic invasive species uh, at just over 9 percent um, that, that I just referenced. So we look at the budget enhancement, E230, position changes to create a new full-time wildlife area tech. This is the companion unit uh, where we're uh, talking about creating two wildlife area tech two positions to replace temporary contractual staffing to allow higher level staff to continue operating the four watercraft inspection stations while implementing other key elements of the AIS program at Lake Mead. Two tech level state uh, full-time uh, equivalent positions are critically needed to provide continuity of program skills and knowledge, year-round management and support functions for the AIS program at Lake Mead and to continue containment measures of preventing the spread of, of quagga mussels. E231 um, position changes to create new full-time wildlife area tech two position. Again, uh, creates one position, replaces temporary contractual staffing uh, permanent full-time staffing at the Alamo Roadside Station located on northbound lane of, of Highway 93, approximately 10 miles south of Alamo in, in Lincoln County. Station is a key location that allows interception of northbound trailered watercraft from quagga mussel infested waters in southern Nevada and the lower Colorado River Basin before they reach destination waters in eastern and central Nevada or northern states. Uh, one tech level full-time equivalent position is needed to provide year-round free of charge inspection and decontamination services to watercraft users. A state uh, position is critical to provide operational stability and for oversight of contract staff when available uh, to address those, those peak periods. So it would be augmented. This 231 uh, would be 20, uh, excuse me, 75% sport fish restoration and 25% uh, AIS fees. So, um, a quarter of that would be uh, paid for by that aquatic invasive uh, species stamp. E710 replacement equipment, uh, replacement of equipment to maintain uh, fish hatcheries. Um, this decision unit includes items such as uh, air blowers, electro fishing unit, water quality sampler, um, a generator and the electronic fishing units and, and uh, outboard motors. E711, uh, replacement of vehicles that have reached their end of useful life. Uh, again, 75, 25 uh, federal, 75% and 25 uh, sportsman revenue on those. Uh, same breakdown on E720, uh, the new equipment, this would fund new one new utility uh, terrain vehicle and riding uh, maintenance equipment in uh, FY22 for use in hard to get to areas in eastern Nevada uh, by survey crews and biologists uh, with the hopeful uh, benefit of, of decreasing wear and tear on um, vehicles. Uh, also requested for both years is a new fish hatchery equipment. Uh, fish hatchery equipment includes uh, large tools and equipments uh, used in laboratories, mail rooms, clinics and shops, including heavy construction equipment. Um, the items to be purchased in FY23 include a new trailer. And then finally, E800, the cost allocation uh, back to the director's office. And that concludes that presentation on budget account 4465. I'd just finally say the game division, as we uh, just talked about, is responsible for management, protection, research, and monitoring of wildlife classified as game mammals, upland, migratory birds, and fur-bearing mammals. Fisheries Division works to ensure the health and vitality of Nevada's fish and amphibians in all streams, rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. And then the Wildlife Diversity Division, whose budget closed previously, is responsible for most non-game wildlife in the state uh, and those uh, non-aquatic, uh, non-game species. So that uh, concludes uh, the budget presentation for 4465, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, uh, 
Simone Peters has the question. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and similar to my previous question, um, I'm looking at your E230 um, enhancement, which replaces the contract staff with two full-time positions. Can you talk about um, how those two full-time positions were determined as opposed to a single full-time position to address those needs identified? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Peters. And there was much of the same uh, logic applied to some of the challenges uh, with contractual staff. Um, we had a significant amount of turnover. Um, the level of, of skills uh, wasn't what we could uh, hopefully obtain through um, an agency position as opposed to a contracted position. But I would, I would also like to invite, invite our fisheries division administrator, John Schoberg, to maybe uh, highlight some of those uh, specific challenges and share some of his thoughts um, in uh, recommending this, this uh, transition. John, are you on? Director Wosley, Chair Dennis. Uh, John Schilberg lost connectivity. He texted me and said that he had just lost, lost connectivity in his house, but he will be unavailable for questions. So I'll, I'll just add further. Um, you know, we, we know that we have Director, a. Director, this is um, Senator Dennis, Chair Dennis. Um, I need you to make sure when we're switching between people, we've got to have everybody identify themselves because the secretaries have a hard time um, figuring out who's saying what. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, that was Deputy Director uh, Jack Robb indicating that Fisheries Division Administrator John Schoberg had lost connectivity. So for the record, uh, Tony Wasley, uh, Director, and I'll add um, that many of the many of the concerns were similar. Many of the challenges were very similar to what we expressed previously in in um, staffing uh, seasonal positions at, at Lake Tahoe. Uh, with Lake Mead situation, um, we know that we we have quagga mussels, you know, within that body of water. We know that the state of Nevada wants to try to contain them. Uh, our ability to contain mussels to that body of water in Nevada and um, in, in, in Nevada more so than, than you know, pre preventing the uh, infestation not only of other waters in Nevada, but certainly preventing um, infestation of the Pacific Columbia River system and the Pacific uh, Northwest and what might happen to um, the water purveyance in, in Oregon and Washington. Um, you know, puts an added level of pressure and expectation on, on the state of Nevada. The way that we're able to do that is um, by staffing key areas in the state where people travel through as they're leaving uh, Lake Mead with potentially in, infected uh, vessels. Um, we have tried to do that with uh, a portion of that staff being uh, contracted staff and it, it hasn't um, been as efficient or as effective if we had some uh, full-time uh, wildlife area tech positions, uh, we feel that we could have a, a higher level of expectation, compliance, uh, more consistency um, with you know, filling those uh, needed roles for inspection to contain uh, quaggas in that, in that portion of the state. Okay. Thank you. I've got um, Senator Gokichia and also Assemblywoman Titus has a question. And I see Assemblywoman Tolls. Yeah, let's go in that order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Tony, I was just curious, how many uh, aquatic uh, stations do you have across, uh, across the state? And are most of those contract rather than, I'm very familiar with the one in Alamo and what a way to spend your, <laughs> your year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Senator Gokichia. Uh, and I, I don't know off the top of my head how many. Uh, we do have um, very limited agency staff uh, committed to those. Uh, it, it's overwhelming. It's historically been an uh, overwhelming majority of, of contracted staff. We have a coordinator in headquarters, and then we've had two people in the field as full-time employees, and then a number of, of contracted staff some of the uh, capacity rotates around to uh, areas of, of high need, uh, but we try to we try to have a presence uh, on some of the most 
heavily used waters in the state. Part of it is contamination, um, containment of contamination around Lake Mead. The other part is prevention at uh, uninfected waters, you know, like like Rye Patch or or Lahontan. But I uh, I would invite uh, Deputy Director Jack Robb to uh, add any any details, uh, given that uh, Fisheries Division Administrator uh, John Schoberg isn't with us today. Uh, Jack, Jack Robb for the record, Deputy Director. I appreciate your question, Senator Goykachia. We have manned stations at Topaz, Rye Patch, uh, Lahontan. South Fork, Wild Horse, uh, Laughlin, and all over the uh, Colorado River system. So those are all man stations. We have upwards of 30 individuals that are contracted, uh, primarily contracted through manpower. And you, as you can imagine, a lot of those contractors are looking for full-time jobs with full benefits with the retirement system. So it's hard to maintain those people. Even when we get a good one, they're looking or something more than what we can offer them through the manpower situation. So that is a need that we have trying to get some of these positions converted into a full-time position and away from that manpower scenario. Thank you, and so at least 30 stations and uh, Jack? Uh, I'd say seven, eight stations with 30 employees. You were muted for that last time. I'm assuming you were saying thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Senator. It's seven or eight stations uh, with uh, 30 employees. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Titus. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First, uh, I want to thank Director uh, Wasley and your team um, for, for the many budgets that you presented today and the excellent work you're doing to help preserve and appreciate Nevada's wildlife all throughout Nevada. Um, I have a number of questions, if I might, Mr. Chair. First, with the pretty dramatic increase in uh, TAG applications, uh, by the way, I just submitted mine, again, contributed to the cause, um, and in the number of fishing licenses that have been uh, given, I'm not really seeing an increase in the number of uh, fish that are planted or the resources that are available, and I'm concerned that we're loving Nevada to death here. and so. How are you offsetting this increased interest in making sure that the sportsman has a positive outcome? With the tag, you can control that better. I realize that, Director Wasley, because you can limit the number. You, you can An unlimited number of people can apply, so that's good for revenue, but you can cap the number of tags, and that's part of the management program. But it's not quite the same with the fisheries program, because as you have this unlimited number of people applying for fish, fishing license, they can go out and catch fish based on the limit. So are we increasing the uh, number? I, I know we have a limited number of hatcheries. One is in my district and, and the Mason Valley hatchery. Uh, I'm just worried about how are we maintaining the adequate number of fish so that the experience can be good and we actually can have a good fishing program. That's my first question. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Titus. Um, we, we, through surveys, so uh, identify board, yourself. I'm sorry, uh, for the record, Tony Wasley, uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Titus. Uh, this is where our survey and inventory uh, data can document if use is actually impacting the availability. Um, and so we have probably the, the tale of two worlds where we have uh, streams that never see a soul or reservoirs that, you know, are fished maybe once a month. Uh, and, and then the, the opposite of that, you know, might might be an urban fishery, uh, what we might call a put and take fishery. One of the ways that we're trying to uh, meet some of that increased demand is through the development of, of urban fishing programs. Uh, we recently developed a, a, a pond with a number of partners in, in Winnemucca. Uh, we're exploring the possibilities of developing a, a similar opportunity with, with community and industry partners in Elko. Uh, we've done that in uh, in Las Vegas. We've we've done it in uh, Carson City. Um, so one of the ways we do that um, is through those urban fisheries and put and take. We also augment our sport fish production in those hatcheries by purchasing, uh, especially warm water fish, catfish, and bass uh, for those uh, warmer climates. Uh, we can augment our our fish 
production simply by purchasing uh, fish from other places, other states, and bringing those those fish in. And we'll continue to to monitor not only the experience those anglers are having, but the populations in those waters. And um, you know, we we uh, we certainly uh, don't want to uh, sell something that we we can't deliver. Um, our belief is that uh, a number, majority of our fisheries are underutilized and we haven't seen um, the impacts of overfishing. Uh, certainly if we do and where we do, uh, we'll aim to, to augment those waters, whether we need to try to increase production, which is pretty much at capacity with our facilities, but uh, might mean purchasing uh, fish from somebody else out of state perhaps. Yeah, thank you for that follow up on that one, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, because I am worried. I do fish at Topaz and have um, a little bit of property up on the West Walker and concerned about the number of people I see there and really the limit, limited number of fish that are actually being caught, concerned about that. And thank you for the pond in Winnemucca. My grandkids just went there yesterday, had a great experience. It's always a, a that's a good family one. Uh, my next question, if I might, um, looking at your budget that you submitted on, on this particular fisheries budget, um, on the major, the full budget that we have and the, and the major three volumes that we have, your your recommendation from your department for the, the fisheries was $9,411,000. Um, and um, the GovRec was 8797000 So I'm not seeing that in this presentation, the discrepancy there and where, what the gov rec was versus what your request is. Is there some place that you guys came to agreement on what the actual numbers are? Are we following what the what your request is versus the gov rec? Uh, that is a, oh, Tony Wasley for the record. Apologies, Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Titus. And, and uh, I do not have uh, the answer to that question. I would invite uh, Deputy Director uh, Bonnie Long to uh, just see if she off the top of her head is aware of that discrepancy and might have a, a response. All right. Uh, for the record, Bonnie Long, Deputy Director with Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, actually, I'm not seeing um, the, the difference. I'm looking at agency request in the, um, the total um, Oh, my apologies. I was looking at base. I'm switching over. I'm, I'm not certain on what the discrepancy is, but we can certainly, I can lay it out and provide that information to you after the meeting. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's in, it's on our budget binder, the major thick budget binder, and it's um, 1014465. And there was quite a bit of discrepancy between the GovRec and the agency request when we looked at that. And so I, yeah, I was too, I too was trying to figure out it. Some of it was in transfer sports revenue and those kind of th things. So so it's just seemed a little different from what the governor had recommended. So um, if we could get some clarification on that, I'm sure the committee would like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And th that's that's my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Simone and told. Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, thanks for pointing that out to colleagues. Woman Titus, I'm, I'm also seeing those discrepancies and. I think you've got a lot of people on this committee who love, love to fish. So <laughs> there's a lot of interest in uh, in this particular um, budget. I'm just uh, curious, knowing that we're anticipating um, severe drought and knowing how that stresses the fish um, and that there's certain strategies that we put into place to help um, with restoring the, the fish habitat and you know putting in culverts and how we divert water and so on and so forth to help with that. Are you anticipating that there's going to be an increased strain on your workload this summer as a result? And, and will these three new wildlife area technician positions help with that? Tony Wasley, for the record, thank you for the for the question, Assemblywoman Tolls. Um, the the challenge is that it, you know, we, we don't necessarily have that that crystal ball to be able to predict what you know snowpack's going to be like and as we're uh, rearing fish and producing fish, there's a, an element of, of, I guess, hope or trust that the water flows and levels will be adequate um, to support any fish that are that are planted and stocked in into those waters. So, um, on on that side of things, it it can certainly change where we put fish. It can change uh, 
how long we keep fish or the size at which they're released. And, and it goes back to some of the statements about, you know, being uh, flexible and adaptive. Um, the challenges that, that a drought brings um, isn't doesn't really manifest itself in a way where we are um, altering water flows and, and regimes that a lot of that falls uh, outside of our jurisdictional authorities. Um, it can create issues uh, in reservoirs and, and holding capacities and minimum pool. Um, and we do some salvage operations where if a, if a reservoir or a stream or like Truckee River in downtown Reno got to zero CFS and we had outcries from a, a lot of anglers to salvage those fish or uh, and so, you know, sometimes it, it does create um, some unanticipated challenges and redirection of capacity. Uh, these positions that, that you're asking about um, don't really uh, have any role or, or function on, on those roles and responsibilities. These are primarily uh, to provide the inspection and decontamination uh, services associated with the Aquatic Invasive Species Program and prevention of uh, contamination of, of other waters. Um, so those, the, the roles and responsibilities that you referenced would fall to existing staff. And this was just a conversion from contracted, uh, contracted uh, staff to man the, the inspection stations to full-time staff. There could be some, uh, additional some ancillary benefits in times of the year where we don't have a lot of boat traffic um, and we could perhaps benefit from additional capacity to do some surveys or, or inventories. Um, I, I hope that answers your, your question, Assemblywoman. Yeah, thank you. Follow up, Chair? Yes, go ahead. So um, thank you for some of those clarifications that these new tech positions are going to help that it'll fall on existing staff. Are you anticipating that we'll find ourselves in that same situation this summer potentially or do you feel that we have the adequate resources to prevent that that kind of stress i i live and fish right um near the uh, Truckee river in reno that um just just a couple miles outside of downtown so i i know that that's um where we felt the strain and are you telling me that you think that we will be able to prevent that situation again this summer with the current staff that we have yeah, Tony Wasley for the record. Thank you, Assemblywoman Tolls. Uh, I, I do um, I do believe that that we aren't in a situation that is quite as dire as it was a few years ago when we saw the Truckee at officially at zero CFS. Um, of course, um, we have some significant concerns about the snowpack, uh, and when when the snowpack isn't there, the flows aren't there. When the flows aren't there, then the water temperature go up and as the temperatures go up the stress on the fish go up uh, and catch related immortality also goes up um, where we get into uh, you know real problems is when we have you know, back to back to back years and uh, of that drought um, there you know we certainly do a lot of survey monitoring we've salvaged um, you know, large trout from from some of the irrigation ditches and, and put them back into areas where there's more predictable and suitable uh, flows. Um, I've got my fingers crossed that despite our concerns on the absence of snowpack and and the incredibly dry winter that, that you know, we'll see some effects, but not as dire as we saw a few years ago. Um, and we'll continue to, to monitor, monitor the situation. Um, my hope is is that next winter is uh, better than than this winter. We we uh, we frequently uh, we see a, a, a I won't say a battle, but a, a, maybe an ongoing debate between uh, game biologists who hate high snow loads because it it causes mortality in, in ungulate populations and fisheries biologists who want more snow because the fish depend on the water. So maybe an upside would be, uh, you know, a lot of carryover in our ungulate and upland bird populations, uh, sage grouse not with, notwithstanding, but some of those mountainous uh, species. So um, in the short term, concerned, uh, but not um, really alarmed, but we'll certainly monitor the situation and hopefully be able to avoid uh, some of the dire dire situation that occurred a few years ago in the Truckee. Thank you so much for the answer. 
or anything. It's all about trying to keep it in balance. I can appreciate that. And if you need any direction on some great spots to drop some fish, I can point out a few. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, something from Watts, you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll be following up with the some of them told on that. Yep. Uh, and actually, I think this question was mostly answered uh, from some of the questions that came from Senator Goykachia, but I'll just ask it as a clarifying on E231, this position at the Alamo Roadside Inspection Station. It sounds like Director Wasley and, and, and Mr. Rob, you explained how the challenges that are faced in trying to find part-time and, and contract support for these, um, uh, especially in some of these remote areas. So I guess I really just wanted to confirm that by moving this to a full-time position, you you actually think it'll be easier to find uh, somebody to, to fill this position out uh, in Alamo or in Peronigat? Yep. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Watts, Tony Wasley for the record. Uh, I think when you look at the situation uh, that we currently have where we're talking about eight stations and 30 employees and we have uh, you know, 30 uh, employees through manpower and we have essentially three people within the department who um, provide oversight as as FTEs and so we go from from three positions with uh, skill knowledge ability supervisorial responsibilities over 30 uh, contracted people that come and go and may show up and may not show up and are seeking employment elsewhere and are maybe good at one thing. But, um, and, and what we're looking to do is to increase our capacity, um, just a few bodies uh, that have uh, the ability to take on more uh, responsibility, that have more skills, more responsibility, um, more consistency to provide that oversight and direction so that we don't have our, our one staff specialist in headquarters and our two AIS field people um, trying to herd cats that are a constant revolving door with, with turnover. So absolutely, uh, yes, Assemblyman Watts, we uh, believe that what, what the creation of these positions would do is provide us an enhanced ability um, to run those stations and still have a significant uh, number of, of contracted positions, but have uh, some consistency, have some capacity that is consistent, dependable, knowledgeable, that can provide some oversight and repeatability, um, you know, year in and year out. Thank you very much for that, Ted Director. And so you don't anticipate any issues with recruitment for this position, should it be approved? Uh, thank you again, Assemblyman Watts, Tony Wasley for the record. Uh, I, I don't believe so. Uh, we haven't had um, problems in recruiting for those uh, you know, full-time uh, positions in the past. And uh, we, we enjoy, typically enjoy a great deal of interest in the positions that, that we offer. offer. Uh, some people see it as an opportunity to have a foot in the door and, and maybe ascend to a fisheries biologist position. And it does provide a, a great opportunity uh, for us to, to glean some insights as, into uh, you know individuals you know personal and professional abilities, um, and so we we can look at that um, as a potential you know promotional opportunity elsewhere in the agency too. Great, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Any other questions on this budget? Okay, so we'll go ahead and close that budget, and that's our last budget. Um, Director, thank you. Um, for the presentation and uh, um, so we'll go ahead and, and finish that up. Um, we do have to take a break here for a second. I, I, I probably need staff to get on and tell us what we need to do. Um, you're gonna be um, given the, the, the uh, packet that we need in order to do the budget closings. How much time do we need for that? Um, Chair Dennis, this is Alex Hartz for the record. We will need about five minutes. We will um, start working with the committee secretary and then ask uh, the secretary to inform us once the uh, packet has been posted and available to both the public, the agency, as well as uh, subcommittee members. 
Okay, so we'll, so for sure we'll take at least a, a five minute break um, and you'll this will be sent to you. You'll need to get it printed out or whatever, right? Is it so, so um, why don't we just go uh, till five after 10? That, hopefully that gives us enough time and we'll check, we'll at least check in at five after 10. So we'll be, we'll be in a pause until then.
I am told we are now live. Thank you. So we are back, uh, back on the record um, in the committee. We are going to do a uh, closing, um, budget closing, and staff's going to walk us through that. But before we do that, I want to make sure that anybody out there trying to get a copy of it knows how to do that. We're going to have um, Mr. Lizer from our staff uh, walk us through that. Thank you, Chair Dennis. Uh, for those that are following along, um, I'm going to share my screen. Which I believe is is now viewable and so I'm going to walk through how you can locate the closing documents uh, from our homepage uh, the Nevada legislature's homepage in the upper right hand corner if you nav navigate to Nellis bring up the Nellis page along the left hand side is the daily schedule for today's meetings and if you go down to the eight o'clock Senate Committee on Finance and Assembly Committee on Ways and Means Subcommittees on Public Safety, Natural Resources and Transportation, click that link. It will bring up the today's meeting page along the left hand side of the web page. There is a section for exhibits. You click on that arrow to expand the selection. There is an option uh, titled 0331 underscore public safety closing packet. You click on that document. It will bring up the closing documents and for ease of view and printing, um, I would offer that you along the right hand side of the page right above the document, there's a little folder with an up arrow that will open this up in PDF view and we'll have the closing uh, document materials that the staff and the committee is about to walk. With that I will stop sharing, uh, Mr. Chair, and I think we are good to go. Thank you very much. So we're going to go to the budget closing now, um, and staff will walk us through that um, the presentation. Thank you, Chair. My name is Christian Tower for the record. I would yes. also, I'm an LCB staffer, the Fiscal Analysis Division. Before the subcommittee today are closing recommendations for the four budgets of the Colorado River Commission. The Colorado River Commission's key function is to manage and protect Nevada's allocation of hydropower and water resources from the Colorado River. The Colorado River Commission is entirely funded by its customers, and does not receive state or federal funds. The first budget under consideration is the Colorado River Commission budget, which is the administrative budget of the Colorado River Commission. And the committee will find it from page three on in the closing package. This budget was heard by the committee on March 24th, um, and it has one major item recommended in the governor's budget, uh, which the committee will find on page four. Decision Unit E-250 adds one new power facilities manager position to the Colorado River Commission budget. During the 24th of March hearing, the Colorado River Commission indicated that it expects development activities in the Las Vegas Valley to increase in the upcoming biennial. This increase is expected to result in a growth in customer demand for the services of the Colorado River Commission. According to the agency, the new position would allow the Colorado River Commission 
to meet this anticipated growth in demand for services. Does the subcommittee wish to recommend the addition of one full-time permanent state power facilities manager position? Thank you. So, so just so we're clear, we're going to go through each one of these, and then at the end, there's also one that goes. So, is there any questions on this one? Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we have no questions or discussion. Right. Go, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I move to accept the recommendation to uh, for the addition of the one time permanent state power facilities manager position. And I also uh, move to recommend fiscal staff's recommendations of the other closing items for items one through three, as recommended by the governor and provide authority to staff to make technical adjustments as necessary. Okay, Senator Brooks, you second. second. Thank you. Uh, let me just ask staff, are, are we okay on that? motion i want to make sure that as we start out that we're we're good so, so i believe we have now um made the, ma the major issue motion and the other items motion all at once um and i would i would refer to management of lcb whether this is a procedure that 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 is acceptable can we combine the two or do we need to do them separately is the question Chair dennis the subcommittee can combine the two as long as it's clear that you are in fact combining both uh, both decision points in, in this one motion and the second. Great, and I, I think that we have done that. So I, I will go ahead and accept the motion and second. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Not hearing none, uh, if the secretary would uh, call the vote, do the vote. Assemblywoman Miller. Yes. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Assemblywoman Peters. Yes. Assemblywoman Titus. Yes. Assemblywoman Tolls. Yes. Assemblyman Watts. Yes. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goy Kachia. Yes. Chair Dennis. Yes. And and I believe we can have uh, Simone and Monroe Moreno when she gets back record her vote. Is that correct? Can she do that? If you would like her to, yes. Okay. Yeah, so I just got to remember to do that when we get to that. Okay, so um, the the the, uh, the motion passes. So we'll go on to the next budget or the next decision point. Thank you, Chair. Chris and Tao for the record. And Chair, with your permission, I will now begin presenting the budget, which the subcommittee has not previously reviewed for the Colorado River Commission and for which fiscal staff is responsible for developing closing recommendations. I will pause following my presentation of each budget to allow for questions. When I have presented the last budget in this group and questions have been addressed, the chair may wish to ask for a single motion for closing consideration on all of the budgets for which fiscal staff is responsible for developing recommendations. The first budget in this group of budgets for which fiscal staff is responsible for developing recommendation is the research and developing, excuse me, the research and development account budget. Subcommittee will find this in the closing package on page seven on. There are no major items recommended for this budget. There are also no other items recommended for this budget. 
if there are no questions concerning this budget, I would move on to the second budget in the group of budgets for which fiscal staff is responsible for developing recommendations, which is the power delivery project budget, which the subcommittee finds from page nine in the closing package off. Let me see if there's is there any questions on this on this one. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, let's go on then. Our delivery project budget. On page 10, the subcommittee will find three other closing items recommended for this budget. Other closing item one recommends the maintenance of one agency owned vehicle. This recommendation is consistent with the decision taken by the committee to add one power facilities manager position to the Colorado River Commission administrative budget. Other closing item one, the maintenance of one vehicle, would guarantee that the new power facilities manager has a vehicle available, which would be decisive for the fulfillment of the task associated with that position. Other closing items two and three concern cost allocation. All of these other closing item recommendations appear reasonable. And I would turn it back to the chair whether there are any uh, to see whether there are any questions on this budget. Any, any questions, committee? Not hearing any and not seeing any. So let's go ahead and go to the next. Ms. Antal, for the record, um, the next budget for which staff is responsible for developing closing recommendations is the power marketing budget, which the committee will find from page 11 on in the closing package. On page 12, the committee will find um, a recommendation of an other closing item. There are no major closing, closing issues in this budget. There's an other closing item which concerns cost allocation. This other closing item recommendation appears reasonable to staff. I will turn it back to the chair to see whether there are any questions concerning this budget. Do we have any questions? Not seeing any. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Thank you, Chair Christian Tao, for the record. For the summary. Um, I come now to the staff recommendation concerning um, closing consideration before the committee. Fiscal staff recommends that the following budgets be closed as recommended by the governor and requests authority for staff to make technical adjustments as necessary. Budget 296 4497, Colorado River Commission research and development account. Budget 502-4501, Colorado River Commission power delivery project with other closing item one being consistent with the approval of a new position in the Colorado River Commission budget. And finally, budget 505-4502, Colorado River Commission Power Marketing Budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, before I ask for a motion, do we have any questions on any of the budgets that we've just gone over? Any questions on on what the motion? Okay. Oh, then, uh, Simon Miller. Yes, Chair. I'd like to make a motion to um, accept the recommendations from fiscal staff that the following budgets be closed as recommended by the governor and, re and grant the request for authority for staff to make technical adjustments as necessary for the following budgets of budget 296 4497 CRC research and development account, budget 502 4501 CRC power delivery project with other closing item one closing contingent upon the approval of a new position in the Colorado River Commission of budget 296-4490 and budget 505-4502 CRC power marketing. Thank you, we have a motion, Senator Brooks, you second. 
Second, please. Um, any any further discussion on the motion? Okay. Um, if uh, secretary, please call the vote. Assemblywoman Miller. Yes. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Assemblywoman Peters. Yes. Assemblywoman Titus. Yes. Assemblywoman Tolls. Yes. Assemblyman Watts. Yes. Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goy Kachia. Yes. Chair Dennis. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Um, okay, so that's that budget. So we'll go ahead and close that portion of the agenda. We'll move to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, public comment. Um, if BPS could open the public comment line and queue up the first caller. Thank you so much, Chair. We are currently on public comment. If you have joined the call and would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 226, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller with the last three digits, 226. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you so much. My name is Mauricia Baca, spelled M-A-U-R-I-C-I-A. -I -I -A. B is in boy, A-C-A -A for the last name. And uh, I, I'd like to thank the chair and the committee members for this opportunity to present. Um, I'm appearing today as the state director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada, and I'm appearing to offer support in uh, to offer testimony in support of the budget request for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. NDOW has taken leadership on important issues impacting wildlife and people in Nevada by serving as the state's game warden. They are an integral part of our outdoor recreation economy. And indeed, most of the department's budget is funded by fees that are collected to support hunting, fishing, and boating. So in my testimony today, I simply want to highlight the important role that NDOW plays in the con conservation of all species in Nevada. They work across the state to enhance and restore wildlife habitat, including the operation and maintenance of state wildlife management areas. They offer educational programs and materials to Nevadans and visitors of all ages. They coordinate effectively with other state agencies to implement solutions that are good for both people and wildlife. For example, in partnership with the Nevada Department of Transportation, NDAL worked to construct wildlife crossings over roads that experienced a high volume of animal vehicle collision. Apologies, I'm here at home with dogs. NDAL plays a critical role in enhancing our state's biodiversity by studying and monitoring species and habitats. They provide valuable science-based data and information Finally, our conservation staff at TNC appreciates the good working relationships we have with NDOW staff across multiple divisions. They are consistently professional, responsive, and knowledgeable. And we hope that you will fully fund their budget request. Thank you so much for hearing this comment. I'll go on mute now, especially with my dogs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we should identify the dog for the record. No. <laughs> it's appropriate that we're talking about wildlife and we have animals with us. So. Um, thank you. Let's, let's move on to the next uh, caller. Thank you, Chair. As a reminder, we are currently on public comment. If you have joined the call and would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional public commenters at this time. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much. Thank you for everyone that uh, participated and presented today. Thank you to the committee. Um, we've got our first um, budget as a committee, as a subcommittee um, done today. 
and uh, we're going to get more of these as we move along and so we thank for all the work that the staff has put together and with that we have no further items um, to come before us at this time so we are adjourned <laughs>